salvation, Lord, that you have done. Died on the cross for our sins. Lord, if there's anyone here today that haven't asked you into their hearts, Lord, I pray that they'll make it right with you today. Lord, bless us this day and uh, help us focus on the word being preached today. Search our hearts, Lord, and help us to sing praises to you, Lord, through this morning service. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 810. Mind coming up and helping me? Tim. He's helping. All right. We're going to see the fishers and men. So we're going to get the fishers and men.
have you here this morning. So glad that you've made a uh, effort and, and, and taken the opportunity to gather for worship this beautiful Lord's Day. Uh, first Sunday in October. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Yes. Uh, but praise the Lord, He's given us, uh, uh, you know, the year up to this point. And if He wills, He'll give us even more time to serve Him. Just a few announcements. We'll of course be meeting afterwards uh, at two o'clock. We're going to the. Uh, it's called the Regency Care Center now, but the nursing home uh, there near Forest Park. Behind, behind Forest Park there, and uh, that's today. Six o'clock tonight, we'll be having a service again here. Hope you're able to make it. And then uh, coming up Wednesday, Bible study at seven o'clock. And then on Friday, something special. It'll be at our home uh, up in Marysville. We'll be having a, a, a fellowship. So uh, hopefully, we're going to put together a campfire. We're going to have a bonfire, but then we move back to the back into town. I don't think my neighbors would like me having a bonfire in our yard. So we'll have a campfire. How's that sound? And. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, well, Pastor, what if it rains? Well, well, we'll, we'll light it up in the fireplace and uh, roast mar marshmallows that way. I don't know. We'll have a fire one way or the other. Uh, but that's Friday night, 637. Whenever you can make it, love to have you out. And uh, But I think we're going to do, if you could bring just a side dish or a dessert, I think we're going to do that. And then we'll provide a, a main. Yeah, we're going to have baked potatoes and chili and because uh, it's starting to get cold. Amen. So that's a good <laughs> cold weather meal. So that's Friday night. Uh, the seventh coming up, of course, uh, this month we have. Um, I was going to miss it here in a minute. Uh, we have ladies' Bible study. Will be are we having a ladies' Bible study here in October? We are having a ladies put together the. Um, the okay, so bag. not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday. So we have what we call blessing bags. Uh, we have folks that come off the street all the time, and a lot of times they're looking for money, and that's just not something you know we do necessarily. Uh, but we put together bags. We call them blessing bags, and they've got all kinds of different necessities that folks could use, you know, if they're not really without, if they're without a home. So uh, we'll be putting those together on that next Tuesday. That'll be at 6.30 here at the church, right? Okay, so uh, that's what's going on. Uh, we will be having a, a fellowship at the end of the month, as well as keep in mind, pray about our Veteran Sunday in November, and uh, looking forward to honoring all the men and women that have served our country, and uh, an opportunity to do that. Uh, but beyond that, did I miss anything? I know we've got some birthdays, uh, Mr. Mr. Junior. He's he's with mom today, but uh, he turns what five or four, five. So anyway, but uh, so I've got new candy bars. Sister Christy, I don't know where she, I gave them to Sister Christy. That's the problem. Oh, they're in the box. I gave them to her. I didn't know if they'd make it up here or not. So, uh, <laughs> so I went and got. I was like, man, what am I gonna get? And I got I got Cadbury candy bars this time for our young people and their birthdays. So looking forward to that. Andrew's got a birthday this month going to be old, 14, anyway, a real teenager now, so, all right, well, let's have our young men come take the offering, did I miss anything that needed to be said, it's good to have Julie, her family here today, and you amen. said the nursing home, right, Pat? yeah, nursing home, exactly, and, uh, amen, come on up, guys, let's take the offering, if God, if God lays on your heart to give, do so, uh, if you're here visiting with us today, it's not our expectation that you give, uh, I've been in churches where they press on people to give, and, uh, you know, I'm just glad you're here. And if the Lord leads you to give, give. If not, no, that's certainly fine with you. All right, which one of you fine young men will pray for us today? Andrew, go ahead and pray for us. Dear Jesus, I thank you for the great day you've given us today to worship you and read your word, Lord. Bless Pastor and his people for us. Bless us all. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
you all. All right. Boy, it's good to see you guys. All right. You guys remember the name of our missionary that we've been, uh, we started studying about last week? What was his name? Mr. Hyde. John Hyde. And he had a nickname. What was Mr. Hyde's nickname? Elizabeth? Praying Hyde. Praying Hyde. Why do you think he had that nickname, Cole? Why was he called? He prayed. That's right. Praying Hyde. And he was born in Illinois. You remember Mr. Hyde, he was going to be maybe a Sunday school teacher, but what happened? Do you remember when he was a boy? His brother died, remember? And his brother was going to be a missionary, and he felt that the, that God wanted him, after his brother died, he, God wanted him to, to do that, to be a missionary. And so praying high, boy, he had learned as a young man how to pray. And boy, prayer is so very important. And so, you know, <clears throat> Mr. Hyde knew that God wanted him to go to a foreign land and be a missionary. And I'll tell you, there was nothing to do, and he departed on a ship. Back then, they didn't have airplanes. Isn't it nice that we can get on an airplane and just fly pretty much anywhere in a matter of hours, right? Back then, they would have to go weeks, sometimes even months, on a ship with nowhere to go. You couldn't just run, you know, on the ship, you just couldn't go to Walmart, right? They didn't have internet or TV, Right? I mean, yeah. Could you imagine? So, Mr. Hyde, you know, there was nothing to do, nothing to see but water and the sky as Mr. Hyde was on a ship carrying him across the ocean all the way from the United States all the way to the country of India. For weeks, this ship traveled on and on and on. And, and, and finally, Mr. Hyde prayed because there were some very high waves and storms that the ship had to go through. But you know what Mr. Hyde did? He prayed, and God protected that ship, protected Mr. Hyde, and they got all the way to the country, the land of India. Can you say that? India. 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 Let's see if I have a picture of, of, of India back here. I do. Look at that. So Mr. Hyde, God called him to the land of India to be a missionary. And there's India right there, right? Did you guys see it? So what's uh, what, what, what country is right here? China, India, Pakistan. So India is right there, right? South of Asia, isn't it? And so we see India. Mr. Hyde took a ship all the way from the United States to India. You ought to go home and look at a map and see how far that is. It's a long, long way. And you know what? God, Mr. Hyde knew that God wanted him to preach the gospel to the people of India. It was a difficult place, though, to begin his missionary work. At first, he did not do well. In fact, it was very, very difficult. Let me show you this next page here. Though Mr. Patton studied very diligently, he had a very hard time learning the language. Part of the problem was that, you know, I didn't know this, but Mr. Hyde, he couldn't hear very well. If you can't hear very well, it's very hard to learn a new language, isn't it? Because you can't hear it very well. And that was part of the problem. He felt he was a failure, and he was so discouraged, so discouraged that he felt like, you know what, maybe I should go back home. But you know what Mr. Hyde never did the whole time he was in India? He never neglected his Bible study or his prayer. He spent time with God every day. And so you know what he did? As he prayed, God reassured his heart, said, you know what, you need to stay right here in India, and I will help you learn the language. And so that's exactly what Mr. Hyde did. He worked <coughs> the language and he prayed, God, please help me be able to be able to speak to these people about you. Right from the beginning, the people knew that Mr. Hyde knew how to, how to talk to God. Did you know that? Isn't that a good testimony to have? You know, they discovered that God answered his prayers. And before long, guess what they began to call him? Praying what? Hyde. Boy, that's a good nickname to have, isn't it? I like that nickname. The people learned that Mr. Hyde, praying Hyde, would stay awake long into the night, praying, talking to God, and listening to his voice. You know what they didn't hear from Mr. Praying Hyde, though? A bunch of long prayers in public. You know, there's a lot of people, they'll pray a long time and really, really eloquently in public. But you know what's more, more important about our prayer life? That we do prayers in public or that we do prayers in private? Or is it more important that we pray in public or pray in private? Pray, pray in private with God. No, that's what the Lord instructs us to do. And that's the kind of man Mr. Hyde was. And he didn't only pray at night. In fact, during the day, he would talk with God in a little room that was off of, the, off of his house. 
And in fact, he would be so burdened about praying that sometimes he wouldn't even get hungry. He wouldn't even want to eat. But you know what God did? God answered Mr. Hyde's prayer about learning that difficult language. And after a while, the people said, he can speak in our language. And they began to listen to what Mr. Hyde had to say. Now look what happens here. He had seen the people of India bathing in the river Ganges. Can you say that with me? The river Ganges, right. And that was one of the main rivers that went through India. And you know what they, they would bathe in this river to try to do? They would try to bathe in this river to wash away their sins. Hmm. Can water wash away your sins? No. No. It just gets you wet, doesn't it? And so they would go to that river Ganges and try to wash away their sins. He would see their funerals where they would burn the bodies of the dead. He'd seen their idols and their temples. And he knew that the people of India did what they knew best. They didn't know any better. They didn't know that washing in a river wouldn't wash away your sins. They didn't know that all their different worship doesn't help them get closer to God. Because, you know what, the only way that you can have your sins washed this way is how? Through whose blood? The blood of Jesus Christ. They didn't know that. That's why Mr. Hyde was there. He could not bear the thought of the people of India being eternally separated from God because their sins were not truly washed away. And you know what? God heard Mr. Pa Mr. Uh, uh, Hyde's prayers. Many, as he preached, many people began to listen to what he said. And many people began to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And that made Mr. Praying Hyde so, so happy. Wouldn't that make you happy? Man, he was thrilled. Yet he longed to see more people come to Christ. And so guess what he did? What do you think Mr. Mr. Hyde did so that more people could come to Christ. He what? He prayed. I like that, don't you? You know what the best answer to any problem is? Can I, can you guys guess? What's the best answer to any problem? Pray. Pray. And that's what Mr. Praying Hyde did. He prayed. You know what? God spoke to, to Mr. Hyde every day. And he wants to speak to us as he did to Mr. Hyde. How does God speak to us today? What does he use? The Bible, doesn't he? And his Holy Spirit. Isn't that a blessing? And you know what? God spoke to Mr. Hyde every day through his word. And you know this. The problem is, is that a lot of times, you know why God can't speak to us? It's because we never get quiet before him. That's one thing that Mr. Hyde learned, that if you're going to hear God, you got to get quiet. you got to turn off the TV. you got to turn off the video games. Put away the toys. Are you hearing me? you got to get alone with God. Praying and reading His Word. And you know what will happen if you really try to get alone with God and you listen to God? He'll speak to you. Isn't that a blessing? And that's exactly what happened to Mr. Hyde. Even though Mr. Hyde, praying Hyde, lived many, many years ago. You know what God can use right now? People like Mr. Hyde. People that will get serious about praying. You say, well, I'm just a little kid, Pastor. What can I pray about? Does God, does it matter to God whether you're an adult or a child when it comes to praying? No, sir. Man, you know what? In fact, I think sometimes, you know, God has a better chance of hearing a, a young person's prayer sometimes, I think, because of their faith. Right? Faith. Believing God will answer. Believing God will hear. But I'll tell you this, and I'm almost done. It was not easy for the people of India to leave their religion. Look at that. It was the only religion they had ever known. You know what? Their religion was one where they would actually torture themselves, hurt themselves, thinking that that would make their gods happy. Their religion, you know what it would be? It would be five times a day they would pray to their gods. They would pray to stone gods that would not have ears. Can stone gods hear you? No. Can statues hear you? No. Oftentimes their religion was one of begging for a living because they thought being poor was being more, would make their gods happy. They needed to turn away from idols to the true God and to his son, Jesus Christ. It was not easy. They needed to hear the word of God. They needed the prayers of John Hyde. Aren't you glad that Mr. Hyde prayed for the people of India? Will you pray? You know, we have missionaries, don't we? Yeah. Will you pray? Okay. 
for the missionaries? Do you have, how many here have people they want to have to know Jesus? Maybe somebody you know that's not a Christian. Anybody got somebody like that in your life? You know what the best thing you can do for that person? What? Cole, what's the best thing you can do for that person? Pray for them. Say, God, I pray you'd open their heart, their ears, that they would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. What, do you guys want to see what's going on next week? Well, next week, we're going to find out about this. Whoa. What do you think that is? I know. An elephant. What, do you, what, do you, what kind of elephant? That's, a, that's crazy looking. Yeah, look at all the hands it has. One, <clears throat> two, and three, and four. It's not Six. Five. Hmm. Yeah, so next week, you come to church, we'll find out more about that and what that means. Okay? All right, you can go to your seats. Mr. Mr. Phillips, go on back up. All right. Let's all stand. Grab our hymnals and turn to page number 283. Join us beautiful. Page 
I know our minds are wandering. And we're going, Lord, please help me focus on you right now. Help me put everything behind me right now. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I got an immediate, immediate response out of our prayer. And I just praise the Lord for that. Because it's almost like um, if, if you give him your all, I'm sure he'll give you what you need. And uh, I just praise the Lord for that. It, it opened my eyes to realize that um, he's sincere, and we should be more sincere about giving him time. And I praise the Lord for that. And, uh, anyone else today? All righty. How about you, Paul? I'm thankful for we could have time and it was really cool time spending out with family and and tomorrow I like school but that was a great picture. Picture day. And picture day tomorrow. Amen. Yes, William. Praise the Lord for um, the get-together we had for the kids thing on Wednesday night for class. Um, Ms. Dyson and I are trying to um, not rush through anything or not like that through the lesson, but trying to give more time for the kids to be able to talk about it to see if it actually sunk in their minds of the story. And um, this last Wednesday, they were able to share what they learned or they thought and they got or they asked more about. And... Um, and their prayers were just, I, I still can't get over every time I hear a kid pray. Because um, we adults have a lot on our minds. The kids, they have a lot on their minds, but they share it all. <laughs> and it just opened my eyes, and uh, I just praise the Lord for that. And it uh, encouraged me. And like Pastor said, too, pray pray uh, with the Lord longer with him and uh, you alone than in a crowd. I praise the Lord for that inspiration for that too. Anyone else today? All right. Well, the pastor comes back.
John chapter 3, and I hope to be a help and encouragement to you this morning. I want to preach over the next couple weeks over how sin is incompatible with the Christian. Sin is incompatible with the Christian. And so we're going to start by reading the Word of God. I'm going to ask you if you're able, out of respect for the Word of God, let's stand one last time. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, we're going to read verses 4 through 10. And uh, we're going to stand out of respect for the Word of God. Uh, I'm glad that I can stand before you today and say I preach to you from the Word of God. Not, uh, not my ideas or some man's ideas, but what God has to say. And um, I like we've been studying on Wednesday nights our Bible verses about the inspiration of God's Word. God breathed, God spoke. Uh, and uh, what a blessing to have that confidence. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew there, a little black book. You are certainly welcome to use. And so you'll follow along with me. I'll read aloud. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. The Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, him, in, in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your blessing on this message. I pray for wisdom. Lord, I don't want to lead anyone astray. I want to rightly divide your word. And Father, but I want us to, to cling to your word as the only source of truth. Father, that it is the authority, not what tradition says, not what some preacher maybe has taught, uh, Lord, or some other book might have, but Father, your word is truth, and let you be true, and every man a liar. I pray for anyone here today that is without the Lord Jesus Christ, that is living in a state of uh, maybe deception, uh, Lord, trusting in some sort of religious uh, activity, baptism, or some sort, Lord, a church membership, or praying some little prayer recognizing, Lord, today I pray they'd see what true salvation, God-given salvation, really is. And I pray that we would understand, Lord, uh, what a blessing we are, or, or, or have been given, rather, and uh, to uh, be free from sin, no longer slaves to it. Bless the preaching, and I pray you guide my mouth, the thoughts that I have. I just want to honor you, and I pray you'd help me to do that through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. When you read this passage, there's something that's to me clearly obvious. And it's this. You can determine whether a Christian, whether a person is a Christian or a non-Christian by the virtue of whether or not they practice righteousness or practice sin, right? I mean, you can look at it and make a judgment. You can say, hey, this is right, this is wrong. This person, they say they're a Christian. This person, they say they're right with God. But when I look at their life, things don't quite map up. Is there anything vague in this passage? Look at it again. All right, 1 John chapter 3. <laughs> what does he say in verse 6? Or 
He says, well, let's start verse 6. He says, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now look at verse number 8. He that committeth sin is of the what? Pastor, that's, that's rough. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. Look at verse number 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Look at verse number 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, God rather, neither he that loveth not his brother. Everyone is affected by this verse. But what's taking place in our modern Christianity, our modern evangelism today, is that we have sort of poisoned the waters. Um, we've got this idea, and I believe the gospel has been so watered down and has uh, such a low, people take such a low view of it, it's become toxic. And how important it is that we understand what true salvation, the fruits of true salvation. Don't you agree? I mean, it's a matter of heaven and hell, my friends. It's a matter of life and death. If there's anything more important, I can't think of what it might be. If we don't know, if we're not sure of what God has to say, true biblical salvation is we're in trouble. But thank God we have His Word. Thank God we have the Bible. Thank God that we're not dependent upon the smart guys to tell us what is true and what is right. You say, well, pastor, you say we don't need pastors. I'll tell you this, brothers and sisters. I think there is a place for pastors. I think there is a place for teachers. The Bible says there is. But come to this. When you stand before God, you alone will be accountable. Right? You say, well, pal, you know, I, I, I just wasn't, you know, I was taught differently. The key is you have a Bible. If you're saved, you got the Holy Spirit. And you know, with those two things, with the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, you have every tool you need to be all that God would have you to be, to know everything that God would have you to know. Let me give you some sort of false views of salvation that sort of persist today. Number one, my biggest the one that I think is uh, growing larger and larger is this, that repentance is just uh, synonymous for faith. That really there is no requirement to turn from sin in one's heart and mind for salvation. You can have your sin and you can have salvation too. That's essentially what people say. I've heard this, that faith might not last. It's a gift of God, but it might not last. A true Christian can completely cease believing in God and therefore can come to a place in committing a sin of willful unbelief still be a Christian. Here's another one. Some people say saving faith is simply being convinced or giving credence to the truth of the gospel. It is confidence that Christ can remove guilt and give eternal life. It's not personal relationship with Him. Here's another one. Christians can lapse into a state of permanent spiritual barrenness. Here's another one. Christians may fall into a state of lifelong carnality born-again people who live like the unsaved. Here's another one. You're wrong to judge if someone lives a life of continuous disobedience and prolonged sin to doubt their salvation. Another one, a believer may come to a place where they utterly forsake Christ and can come to a point of not believing. Again, repentance, some people say repentance is not essential to the gospel. In no sense is repentance related to salvation. And I could go on and on and on. Some will say, well, the New Testament writers never question the reality of their reader's faith. So I read all that, and then I come back to chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, don't you? And I say, that's incompatible. Have they not read this passage? When we look at the book of 1 John, it's a series of tests. 1 John is a test for ourselves to first of all evaluate our own relationship with God to see whether or not we line up. It's also a test for Christians to be able to look in the church and say, you know what, does that person line up with what the Bible says? 
We have to be discerning. I preached on taught on Wednesday nights the importance of having spiritual discernment. You know, people are so afraid, right? The world and carnal Christians have so taken Matthew chapter 7, 1, and where it says, judge not lest you be judged, right? Oh, you can't judge. My friends, you can judge spiritual judgment. If you look at the context of Matthew 7, 1, he's saying this. If you read on, <laughs> he's saying, listen, if you judge, be expected to be judged in the exact same way. In fact, uh, it's this idea of critical judgment, this idea of, of judgment based on my standards, my morality. And that's why he says, why do you judge uh, your brother who's got a moat when you got a beam? All right? But when it comes to the Word of God, we can hold ourselves and others to this standard. 1 John is a series of tests. It's a series of doctrinal tests. I'm not going to take you all the way back, but in chapters 1, chapter 2, we talks about how that we have a different attitude towards sin, all these different things. Uh, a Christian, what do they do? They confess sin regularly because they recognize uh, what sin is to God. They love God. They love other Christians. Uh, they, they know they have a right attitude about Christ, a right attitude of the Holy Spirit. Doctrine is a critical test of Christianity. You cannot be saved if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Can you? No. You cannot be saved unless you understand. If, if you sit there and say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe Jesus Christ is equal with God. I don't believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God. You can't be saved. That's false doctrine. But it goes beyond doctrine. There's the, also the test of one's conduct. You have doctrinal tests. You have moral tests. Look at chapter 2, if you would, of 1 John. Look at verse 4. Here's what I love about the Bible. You can't sit there and say, well, the pastor is making things up. Well, no. I'm just going to read you this plain words of God. Look at verse 4. The Bible says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment is a what? Are you, are you reading the same scripture I'm reading? Let's look at it again. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Wow. <laughs> now talk about judgmental. Talk about being a little critical. John says, listen, friends, you say you know Jesus Christ, you say you know God, and you don't keep his commandments. He doesn't soft pedal, does it? I love that about John. He says, you're a liar. You don't know. Because those that do know him live a different way. And so we see that, this idea of test of conduct. We've got a lot of false teachers out there trying to bring people into a sense of false security with God. If you go to chapter 3, verse 10, I think the biggest focus of this letter was to hit against the false teachers. To say, hey man, you got people out there declaring untruths, declaring lies to be the Word of God. Man, you need to judge it by God's Word. False teachers come to uh, this congregation of Christians that John's writing to and confusing and corrupting this community by saying, listen, it doesn't matter your theology, it doesn't matter your behavior, it just matters what you say. Talk is cheap, isn't it? We all know that, don't we? <laughs> How often time, you know, so over there, somebody's over there flapping their jaws about this, that, and the other thing, but things aren't lining up. Their actions be belie, their actions betray really what they mean and what they are doing. The key is in verse 10. The key to conduct is in verse 10. Look at it with me again, chapter 3, verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Now look at the two keys. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now from verse 11 on, it deals with this matter of love, and we're going to get into that. I'm excited to teach you about brotherly love and the things that we ought to do as Christians and how that ought to bear out in our lives. But you know what? We have this idea of righteousness. The difference in the Christian's life is they practice righteousness and they practice love. Chapters 1 and 2, the emphasis is on fellowship. Chapter 3 through 5, it's on sonship. 
You know what? You say you're in fellowship with Jesus, you're gonna, it's gonna, there's going to be reality. Now, a lot of churches won't teach us. A lot of churches are afraid. You say, well, you know, I've had people maybe a little critical. Well, you're just, you know, people are doubting their salvation. Our children are doubting their, hey, man, you, you better get it squared up with the Lord. I want to challenge you. I want you to know, and it ought to come to a place in your life as a Christian that because of your obedience to the Word of God, because right, your life shows it. There's no reason to doubt. Now, salvation has nothing to do. To get saved, to become a child of God, has nothing to do with you. Isn't that a blessing? It's not about you being good. It's not about you obtaining some level of holiness and righteousness. My friends, salvation is all of God. Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross, He did everything necessary to save your soul. But the beautiful thing about true God-given salvation is this. When Jesus gives it to you, it changes your life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Isn't it common, though? Let me ask you. People talk about being a Christian, but boy, their life does not show it. Are you with me? It's pretty common today. I've got people at my work. I like them. They're nice people. They claim to be Christians, but when I look at their lives, I'm like, man, things just don't square up. Things just don't line up. And I, and I appreciate there are Christians that are in different stages of growth. I recognize that. But you know what? It's not like they're just missing one of the tests. They're missing all of the tests, if you see what I'm saying. I mean, they're constantly coming up short in all the different areas that should be apparent and, 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 and seen in the Christian's life. And, and in John's day, like there is today, there were those who claimed to be Christian but they are habitually practicing sin. There is no visible, measurable, dominant love for other Christians, and that is common. There's two statements I want to look at that's critical to our understanding. The first one is in verse number 6. Notice this. It says, Whosoever abideth in him, what? Sinneth not. Now look at verse number 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Verse 6 says what? Sin is impossible. Verse 9 says sin is impossible or incompatible rather. Verse 6 says sin is incompatible. Verse 9 says sin is impossible. You say, no, pastor, those don't line up with what you preached before. Go to chapter 1. Go to chapter 1. Look at verses 1 through 8. Now, in chapter 1, John just got done saying, hey, if you say you have no sin, you're a what? Liar. Wait, but whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Which is it, pastor? (laughs) Feels like you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. In fact, in verse 10, if you say you haven't sinned, you make God a liar. You're basically saying, God, you're a liar. I ain't a sinner. So what does it mean? It opens up a a series of questions, doesn't it? Can a Christian sin and still be a Christian? Uh, uh, How much can a Christian sin? At first reading, we find in chapter 3 that sin is impossible. But in what sense is it impossible? Well, you'll have the perfectionist, won't you? The perfectionist who will say that a Christian can reach a place where they will never sin at all. You just got to work to get to that place. This idea that you can come to a place of sinless perfection. A lot of times it's associated with those who believe you can lose your salvation. So you, you get it, you sin a little, you lose your salvation, but then you pray, you get it back, you sin a little later, then you lose it again, and then you pray and you get it back, you're still making a little progress in your life, and you don't lose it as often, and finally you get to that place where you're not losing it anymore, and, and then you keep progressing, you get to that place where you've reached perfection and you never sin anymore. And you can't lose it because you're perfected. You can't lose your salvation. Sometimes they'll call it the doctrine of eradication, that the sin nature has been eradicated. Is that what it's saying? That a true Christian, the ultimate Christian, the superior Christian, 
is the one who's reached a point of sinlessness. But then you have the other view, don't you? You have the other view, and oftentimes it's called antinomian. This antinomian simply means against the law. And this is the view that you can be saved and have no regard for the law. Just live however you want, right? Man, you want to fornicate? You want to, you know, when you do drugs, you want to, right? Do it. You can still be a Christian. They say, well, a Christian can sin because, frankly, uh, it doesn't matter. We're all under grace. Grace covers absolutely everything. In fact, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So who's right? Can we reach a place of sinless perfection? Can we reach a place where we never on this life and on this earth never ever sin? Or is it the antinomian view where you can basically be a Christian and do whatever you want? Well, I think you know the answer, don't you? Neither is true. Christians do sin. And when they sin, it does matter. And, and how do I know that? Well, the Bible talks about it. First of all, if you go to chapter 1, what does he say? If you look at verse number 8, he says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. He says, listen, someone to say they're not a sinner, someone to say that they don't sin is a liar, and there's no truth in that. Okay? Indeed. Chapter 2, look at verse 1. What, is, what does John say here? He says, my little children, these things write unto you that you what? Sin not. He says, that's the goal. We don't want to sin. We don't want to go against God because we know what sin has done. We know that it was our sin that nailed our Savior to the cross. We know it was our sin that caused Him to suffer. And we see sin like God sees it. We hate it. We don't want to do it. But look at the rest of the verse. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, some people say, well, this is just mortal sins. That's the Catholic sort of thought of it. That uh, if you commit a mortal sin, there's categories of sins, then you're not a Christian. And, and it does research, uh, uh, refer to, they call them venial sins. But I don't see any distinction with that. I, it doesn't talk about mortal sins or less than mortal sins. Some argue mean that, 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 that God doesn't regard it as sin anymore. That God sees as a Christian when you get saved, He doesn't see the sin as sin. Uh, he treats it with indifference. Some will say, well, it's just talking about your new, the new creature. It can't sin. But you can't. The passage doesn't line up that way. And others, fourthly, say that, well, what St. John is describing is just ideal. It's the ultimate goal. That, the, that to be perfect is rarely where we ought to be. But I think the important thing is that we have to understand, and, and this is where grammar makes sense. Didn't you hate grammar growing up? I hated grammar. I hated English. I, I was never, I, and sometimes you'll hear it come out. Sometimes I'll use, you know... <laughs> bad grammar but it was not one of my favorite things but you know when it comes to the word of god it's a legal document you realize that right it's very legal words mean something that's why when the jehovah's witnesses in john chapter one they take it and says in the beginning was the word little w and the word was with god and the word was and they simply put in a an, a, 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 an article was a little g god does that make a big difference about what that passage is saying? Yeah. It's saying Jesus is not God. He was a lesser God or a smaller God, or right? But he's not equal to Jehovah God. And the Bible says the very opposite. But I'll tell you this. A Christian, and here's the premise, we're going to look at it. A Christian does not, cannot habitually and persistently sin. A Christian will sin sometimes, and he will sin willfully, but he'll not sin habitually, persistently, and relentlessly. When someone's saved, they're born again, they're regenerated, they're made new, the whole direction of your life 
is now towards God. The whole direction of your life is towards holiness. Your mind is set on the Spirit. Let, let, we're going to turn to some scriptures, and I apologize. Uh, but go to Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 6. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. The Bible says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. The Christian, his mind is changed. His direction is changed. Your mind is set on the Spirit, man. It's about the things of God. It's about honoring God. And it's about concerning yourself with spiritual things. That's what happens when a person gets saved. In Colossians chapter 3, and I know we're bouncing. If you just want to make a note, that'd be fine too. I don't want to ever discourage you from turning to the Scripture with me. Colossians 3 verse 2. Let me say this. If a preacher ever tells you to put your Bible away and just listen, run. I don't really care what you think, Pastor. What does the Bible say? We would see Jesus, not you. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. What does a Christian do? Well, here Paul is saying to the believers in Colossae, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You know what? Your mind is set on the Spirit. Your mind is set on things above. Not only that, but go to Philippians, just a few pages to your left in your Bibles. Philippians chapter 3, verse 19. The Bible says, <clears throat> and you are disconnected from earthly things. He's talking about the lost, about the unsaved here. And what does he say is true about them? He says this, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. You know, when you get saved, your life changes. You are truly a new creature in Christ. You mind spiritual things. You are concerned about the Spirit of God, listening to Him, following Him. You are positioned towards holiness. You are disconnected from earthly things. You know what? I talked about this, right? A Christian, as they grow, you know what happens? The things of this world, they grow dimmer and dimmer and less appealing and less important. And you know what becomes more important and more visible? The things of God. Right? And you start to see that all the wealth, all the things that the world has to offer, really in the scheme and in the light of eternity, is not that important. Romans chapter 6, I'm not going to turn there, but it talks about the idea of sin not reigning on us any longer. So here's, here's what John is saying. If we go back to our text, He's saying this, my friends. You got two views. A Christian, what's true about a Christian is they are not habitually sinning. It's not a pattern of their life. It's not who they are. But for the lost, it is, isn't it? It truly is. For the lost, unsaved, they live in habitual sin. They sin in their thoughts and in their words, in their actions, and it's an unbroken, habitual pattern. And if they're doing no other sin, maybe they're just sitting there quiet with no thoughts, they still are possessed by the sin of unbelief. That's what they're all about. Habitual sinning. Christians do not. You say, Pastor, I, this is, you're making me feel bad. I ain't me, brothers and sisters. It's the Holy Spirit of God. Hey, would, wouldn't you rather... How many gone to the doctor? Yeah, well, John's here. John's been to a few doctors here lately, right? John, if, could you imagine if you had gone to UW and they said, you know, just take a pill, go home. Maybe they did at first. Don't worry about it. No, they didn't. They, they were on it. I appreciate it. They're a good, good hospital. A good doctor will tell you even that which you do not want to hear. They'll tell you, listen, you got to have a heart transplant. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear that everything's good, doctor. I want to hear that you're just going to give me a bottle of pills. I'm going to go home and wake up better the next day. That's what I want to hear, doctor. The Word of God is like that, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is like that. Boy, He'll lay some things out. And we're like, I don't want to hear that because that's convicting. That means i got to deal with something. That means i got to make a choice. i got to make a decision. But I like that. Because when it comes to salvation, when it comes to matters of heaven and hell, brothers and sisters, I'll tell you this. You don't want to be on the wrong side of eternity. 
And that's exactly what's being said here. If you go, if you would, back to our text, look at verse 8. The emphasis here is this. He that committeth sin, practicing sin, is of the devil. It's this idea of, of perpetual sinning. It's emphasized again in verse number 10. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. It's this idea of continual, habitual, present state sinning. Unbroken pattern. Those that are Christians do not sin in that way. There's three reasons why true Christians are obvious to us. Number one, they do not practice unrighteousness, but they practice a pattern of living righteousness. Why don't we habitually practice sin? Number one, it's because it's incompatible with the law of God. Number two, it's incompatible with the work of Christ. And number three, it's incompatible with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Three arguments for holiness. And if you're a true Christian, you'll believe the truth. You'll behave in a righteous way. You know what? Number one, why don't Christians practice sin? It's because it's incompatible with the law of God. Go back to verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. What does he say about sin? Sin is lawless, right? Sin is lawless. Now, I am thankful for the most part we live in a lawful society, aren't you? That we are generally, not in all cases, I know there are people who don't, whether they be judges or police or whoever, there are people that do not live according to the law, and that is a shame and it is wrong. But generally, our nation is a nation of what? Law. And I'm glad for that. <laughs> I'm glad that we're a nation of law. And, you know, uh, 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 Mr. Police Officer d should not be able to just come, right? Not that this doesn't happen. But should not just be able to come and to throw me in jail for no reason. Now, it happens, and that's a shame, isn't it? It ought not be, because we are a nation of laws. And we all have what? We should have equal protection under the law. Isn't that good? If the law applies to you, it applies to me. If there's no, right? That's how it ought to be. That's the right thing. And that's what, as a nation, we ought to be. And you know what? But sin is a pattern of lawlessness. This idea of sin, I've heard it described this way, but the definition is the idea of missing the mark or wandering off the path, off the way. Sin is a failure to be righteous. And here we're talking, uh, he, he says, we're not talking about sin as a violation we're talking about sin as an attitude. Look again at verse 4. I want you to grab a hold of this. This will help you. If you're habitually practicing sin, then you are lawless as a, Christ, as a Christian or as a person. Because sin is a transgression of the law. And lawlessness is an attitude. Isn't it? <laughs> right? That's why it's silly, and I, I don't know where you stand. You know, they want to make all kinds of laws, right, restricting different things. It's a shame that there's such a cancer and sickness in our society, culturally and morally, that a 14-year-old boy who had been bullied will go and take one of his rif father's rifles, shoot his father, and then go to a playground and shoot some young baby. That's evil, and that's a sickness in our culture, a sickness in morality. Right? And you can blame it on all kinds of things. But I'll tell you this. You say, well, the answer is just to get rid of all the guns. Do you realize this, that if you're lawless, you're not going to care about a law or not? Right? It's like people say, well, we need to ban the guns from, from everywhere. And I'm not making this political, but, but, but follow me. If you don't care about the law, <laughs> are you going to care that there's a law restricting you from bringing a gun to a certain place? Not at all. You're going to do whatever you want. Do you see what I'm saying? Because lawlessness is an attitude. It's a way of living. It's a heart. I don't care. You can make all kinds of laws, but the lawless 
don't care. The lawless are not going to follow what the law says. So this idea in verse 4, it's not necessarily as much as a transgression of the law, but indifference to the law. It's living as there, if there is no law, as if God's law doesn't matter. That's what he's saying. Didn't Jesus condemn the Pharisees in Matthew 7? Uh, Matthew 7, look at verse 23. If you want to list, just listen, that's fine too. Write it down. Let me, let me, let me, what, what is he saying here to the, to the, to the Pharisees? In verse 20, he says, uh, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name done many, uh, cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, what? Ye that work iniquity. What is that? You that are lawless. You that are all about doing your own thing and transgressing my law. And that is characteristic of all the unconverted. They don't care about God's law. They just do whatever they want. They live however they want. They live in a condition of lawlessness, a rebellion against the law of God. Go, if you would, back to our text, and I'm done. This idea of committing sin. You could also see it as, as practicing sin. Doing sin. Right? It's, it's a pattern of life. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Verse 7, let no man deceive you, for he that doeth righteousness is righteous. Verse 8, he that committeth sin. God has standards and the same for everyone. But an unsaved person, that's how they live. They are lawless. They don't care about what God's law says. Now, if you're a Christian, and I'm finishing with this, you don't have that attitude anymore, do you? What God says matters. And when you break God's law, it's heartbreaking. Because guess what? That's your father. And he loves you. And you love him. And because of that fact, you know what? You want to obey him. And it's not an attitude of lawlessness, not an attitude of doing whatever you do, but rather it is simply you've come to that place where, you know what, Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. And that's true of the Christian. The Word of God becomes precious to them. The law of God is sweet to them. It's sweeter than honeycomb. Amen? Amen? Sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. That's what God's law is to the Christian. And so why would they break it? They cling to it. They say, this is my book. <laughs> I don't want to be lawless. I want to be lawful. And that's what's true of the Christian. Didn't you see it in David's life? That's why David is a man after God's own heart. David was converted. You know why? Because when he sinned and was confronted, what was his attitude? Repentance, wasn't it? Broken. You're right. Mourning. Why? Because he had broken God's law. Habitual sin is incompatible with the law of God. Where are you at with God? I'm telling you, my friends. The Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You better be ready. You better be right. What kind of preacher would I be if I didn't stand up? And tell you even the hard messages from God's word. It's a shame you got too many preachers standing up talking about how good things are and how, how God wants you to be successful and happy and well off. No, what God wants you to be is right with Him and being more like Jesus every day. That's the goal. And as a Christian, you know what? There's not a sense of lawlessness. Lawlessness knows there's a sense of love for the word of God is precious. Is it precious to you? Or are you living a life of habitual sin? Said, I don't care. I'm going to do my way and my thing. If that's the attitude you have, I caution you, man. You may not be where you ought to be with the Lord. And if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart right now, what I would challenge you to do, even as we leave this place, is say, God, more than anything, I need to be right with you because heaven and hell are real. And life is short.
Let's pray together. Amen. Father, what a blessing it is to gather this beautiful day for worship. Lord, I pray that amongst us, if there's anyone here today that is uncertain of their standing with you, whether or not they are right with you, whether or not if they stood before you on that day of judgment and and, and whether you would say, come on in, or whether you would say, depart from me. I ask that today would be the day of their salvation. And Lord, if they're clinging to something else, maybe they're clinging to a baptism or to church membership or to you know, some sort of prayer they said, but they've never ever been at a place of true repentance where, Father, their mind and heart has changed about their sin. They've seen sin as you see it as horrible and wicked and deserving of hell, and they threw themselves at the foot of the cross begging Christ to save them. I pray today would be the day of their salvation. That you would change their life. I pray for those in here that are believers. That Lord, as we study through these tests, and as we look at these different doctrinal and tests of conduct, Lord, that we would be even more encouraged to know. God, your will is that we might know that we are saved. Be convinced Lord, we want to be, we don't want to sin. We want to have a goal of sinning not. But thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy that even when we do sin as a believer, Lord, you are so able and willing to forgive. May we help us to be more like Jesus. The rest of this day, and if you give us tomorrow and this next week, pray and I ask. Again, I pray for those that may not know Christ, that today would be the day of their salvation, that Lord, even as they leave this place, that your Holy Spirit of conviction would lean heavily on their heart. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Anything before we go today? I want to say it's a blessing to have Julie. Is this your family, Julie, or friends? Fantastic. Thank you for coming today. It's a blessing to have you, and you're welcome back anytime. Amen. So we actually, Julie, we met Julie a couple weeks ago. Uh, we were doing some door canvassing, and uh, me and four of the kids. You kids remember Miss, meeting Miss Julie? Yeah, it was a blessing because they gave she gave them candy. <laughs> she took care of them, so I appreciate that. Amen. It's good to have John and Rebecca. Marjorie, good to have you back. I know you've been working quite a bit, so amen. And then uh, pray we got some folks out today. Uh, doing some family activities, and we hope to see him back uh, soon. All right? Anything before we leave today? Lord bless you. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next uh, tonight or next week, whenever we're able to see you again. All right, let's be dismissed.